Welcome back to the AI Minds podcast. This is a podcast where we explore the companies of tomorrow built AI first. I am your host, Demetrios, and this episode, like every episode, is brought to you by DeepCram, the number one speech-to-text and text-to-speech API on the internet today, trusted by the world's top conversational AI leaders, startups, and enterprises like Spotify, Twilio, NASA, and Citibank. In this episode, I'm joined by Karun, the CEO and co-founder of Delve. How are you doing today? Doing great. Excited about this. So I am very intrigued by your story, which I want to start with because you're a double dropout. You dropped out of high school and you dropped out of college. Uh, Not many people can say that, but your high school was not the most traditional because you went and you decided to do a few college classes while in high school. Can you explain how that works? Yeah, so I had a very non-traditional route, right? I was going to this competitive high school, and then as part of that, when I realized that this wasn't the best fit, dropped out, and I took like 25 community college classes just as part of that experience. Wanted to really explore and push myself, like go for that exponential trajectory. And as part of that, you know, also did some research at MIT, did like this project that was diagnosing COVID and pneumonia from chest x-rays, bunch of fun stuff, but great experience in terms of like letting yourself loose on those fun things. Yeah. Okay. So you nonchalantly talked about how you did some research at MIT, which is not necessarily something that most high school kids do. You then went and got yourself into MIT and started with classes there. What were you doing and why did you ultimately drop out? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. I actually entered MIT pre-med, right? So it was one of those things where we boil our lives down at Delve to like impact equals value times volume. It's a function mm-hmm. of like how many people can you touch and at what magnitude. And I thought at the time from all the high school experience with healthcare and like health tech that the best way to do this was in a clinical setting. And so I took a lot of like orgo actually my first semester for fun stuff. We don't recommend that by the way if you're thinking about it. Uh, and just had a bunch of like interesting kind of biochem classes. And it's actually how I met my co-founder. We had the same academic advisor. And our first week at MIT, we were just talking about biotech stuff and realized we had a joint passion for it. But it, it was a very, like, fun time of just, like, honestly getting used to the college environment. But after that first semester of, like, really, like, going through just, like, the, the college sink and, like, getting to know my co-founder better, we kind of decided to build something in healthcare and health tech. And that was the start of like the entrepreneurial bug. Okay, so healthcare and health tech is very different than what Delve does today. Can you connect those two dots for me? Because Delve helps folks get certified or helps folks pass regulations, right? And healthcare, health tech startup, I don't see the connection. Yeah, so it's a good question actually, for those that aren't familiar. We help other startups get HIPAA SOC 2 compliant and are looking to build a bunch of other fun things. HIPAA compliance is required in the U.S. if you are processing patient data and working with a covered entity, so something like a hospital or a clinic. And as part of our healthcare stuff, we built an AI scribe. It was used like a customizable version of it, which was given to doctors and clinics, and they can kind of help them take their notes and do that stuff. As part of that, we had to go through the regulatory process of getting HIPAA compliant. And that's oh. where the dots started to connect. It was like, you know, yeah. hey, there's some AI here. There's some things that we can we can improve. I see. So you recognize that, wow, this HIPAA compliance thing is kind of a pain in the ass. Maybe we're going to affect more people. And I, I love that formula that you put together of how many people you can touch or you can affect in the world. And... So you pivoted? Yeah, exactly. So we we pivoted into compliance. We thought that we had a better shot at making exponential change 
working in compliance. And like the story of my life is kind of like pretty, pretty in line with just like taking those bets um, on myself and the people around me. And so that was kind of where this started. And my co-founder and I uh, applied to YC um, and we dropped out and the rest is history. Wow. So what exactly are you doing? The, there's the inspiration for it, but what does the product look like and what are you doing differently? We have three kind of core differentiators right now. We are an AI streamlined platform. So we save you a lot of time getting compliant. We have great customer service, just really direct, especially for the startups that we work with. And we focus on customization to the companies we support. It's not just a black and white kind of compliance setup. It's very like streamlined for the startups that we're working with directly. And as we grow here, right, longer term, the kind of vision for Delve is like, there's a diametrically opposed curve right now between like security and like innovation. And the goal is like, how do we start bridging that gap, making it easier to, to build in these regulated industries? And why do you say that there's this curve or these two are, are growing away from each other, this security and innovation? Yeah, I guess so much happening in AI right now, right? There's so many innovators that I would say like are building, you know, some great products, right? 11X AI, Bland, DeepGram, right? Um, very few people are building strongly in the regulatory space, right? It's like, how do we actually safely build, you know, products that change the world? And our thesis is that like longer term, there's going to be a point where, you know, there's revolutionary technology and nobody to actually like put some guardrails on it and make sure that we're, we're doing it right. And that's the, that's the goal that we're trying to build towards. Now, the compliance space is very full or aggressively competitive i could say is there something that you felt like was missing from all the other offerings on the market and you're plugging that hole is it in the customer support side of things is it in the more white gloved experience or the ai workflows that you talked about yeah it's a great question i think it's definitely the ai workflow stuff Right. At the short term, like, you know, customer support, white glove service, like that's that's the startup do things that don't scale. I think the the goal that we have and the gap that we see in the market is that I have a lot of respect for like a lot of the companies that have been built so far. Um, but just from a pure timing perspective, like we feel that there is like an AI first approach to this, right? Can we build an agent that pulls the data automatically instead of having like an API integration, right? And even further than that, can we have an agent that like automatically configures compliance properly? And that's like the fun stuff that we're working on right now. But, you know, the core differentiation is like currently, it's just like, I think a better service and a more tailored product for startups. I think longer term, it's going to be much more automation in terms of how we actually like set these processes up in a, in a nice way automatically. So I'm not sure I fully understood the agent aspect of this versus using an API. How do you see those two things? Or what would me as an end user, what would my experience be and how would it be different? A great question. So a classic example for compliance is like encryption enabled on a database in AWS, right? It's like a very standard thing that you're going to have to do for pretty much any compliance framework. Um, currently, right, you're going to hook into an API with a compliance vendor. We'll like kind of ping it saying, hey, is this encryption or not? And if it's not, we'll kind of flag that in a UI, right? And that's like kind of the standard way that things are done across all the competitors. Our thoughts like, hey, can we just go into your AWS for you, click the button, come back and store that evidence for the auditors and like do that all in one click. And like the kind of you know, new innovation happening right now enables this. And our take is that like, there's platforms yet to be built that are like conceptualized around the possibility of that technology. You know, like it, it's, it's a fundamental difference, just like how TurboTax was for tax law. It's like a, a similar step up and you're seeing this across the board in every other industry and our takes like, why not compliance do? Wow. So 
first of all, it is crazy to me that you can have non-encrypted databases. That's like a setting that you have to, it feels like it shouldn't that just come straight out of the box like that always. Uh, but there's probably reasons because I do not know enough about security and compliance to know why or why not that is like it is. So I won't speak on that. But what I do like is how you say you can automatically make sure that things are complied. And that implies that you're going to have AI agents that know what compliance looks like, right? And I don't think everyone's compliance is the same and everyone's systems are the same. How do you think you're going to tackle that problem? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. And I think you're hitting on one thing that's super important, which is that everybody's compliance is different and everyone's like approach is different. And if you look at enterprises, right, it's all done in-house on varying tools that aren't our direct competitors right now. And I think longer term, right, it's not a forcing function of can we like enable encryption on AWS or not? At a large scale, that's already done everywhere. It's more of a, you know, given a guardrail, right? Compliance fundamentally, if you look at the, the core, it's always a control, something you need to implement, and a test procedure of how you check that it's implemented. And our, our goal is to like automate the process of those two things, right? Like given a to-do, how do we prove that the to-do has been implemented? That's something that we hypothesize like, scales infinitely across like a startup all the way to an enterprise oh so that's why you take the screenshot and you bring it back and you have a folder that has a bunch of screenshots of like everything was compliant when our agent looked through it because i'm very green in the compliance world you have these audits that you go through with the compliance providers and then what happens if i just go into my aws account and turn off encryption right after that yeah it's a fantastic question so compliance in general will sit on the corporate level of your business so both technical and administrative standards think of it as like aws github your other vendors being secure along with like you have background checks do you have performance evaluations like stuff like that and so we'll kind of help you secure all of those aspects and compliance in general sits on on that like kind of larger broad landscape okay uh, but if i'm nefarious and i turn off my encryption right after the compliance check is there a way to know about that is the agent hanging around is it continuously scanning things to make sure that it's always up to date like daily what does that look like right now we'll kind of recurringly scan stuff and so we'll say like hey you know we noticed this fell out of compliance, like fix it. Um, and then depending on different standards, there's like different observation periods for like SOC 2, for example, where an auditor is going to find a dip in the graph. Um, HIPAA compliance is more of like something you kind of just maintain. Um, and there's like varying levels of this, but generally speaking, I would think of us almost as like observability into like, are you compliant or not? And like anytime you're um, not, we'll kind of remind you to fix it. Okay. And there's a lot of things that you can be compliant for, right? Yeah. Have you thought about what you're going to tackle next? We're still looking into it. I think we're definitely like, you know, shipping the the obvious frameworks very soon. Right. So like HIPAA, SOC 2, GDPR, ISO, PCI, the kind of like core set of like fintech, um, health tech, and just general regulation. Beyond that, we're kind of interested and how we how we look at the broader picture, right? Um, is there some AI stuff that we can do, right? Like there's so much happening, and like, are these the really the regulations that you know help us regulate you know things like open AI, or like is there is there a better approach there? And like that's something that we're still thinking about. Um, that's probably not a question we're going to answer in the next year or two, but maybe the next five. And I think that that's something that we're very curious on. Oh, that's awesome. So as your Looking back at the company you've started so far, what are some of the challenges or roadblocks that you've had and what have you learned from them? Building a company is hard. I think like you can have an idea, but going in and doing it is a very different 
experience, I think we learned a few things, right? One, I think as you're building your company, right, the biggest and most important thing is just keep trying. I think there's so many hurdles you're going to face. There's so many like problems you're going to have. The single biggest factor into whether you succeed or not is if you just kept going through the process or not. Two would be like really making sure that you're trying new things. I think it's easy to just take the standard approach, but like a lot of times the answer is hiding in the clouds and you have to go and get it. And so um, it might mean a different angle, a different take, something like that. Um, it's worth your shot. And, and three is just like keeping your standards high. I think a lot of times it's easy to compromise. It's easy to like fall in the face of comfort. And that's one thing that like you can't do, especially in the other stages. And as you look at your journey, where are some places that you feel like you went left where the majority of folks probably would have gone right? We've, you know, built the wrong thing for months, right? Like we've, uh, we, we were originally doing like a platform as a service for HIPAA compliance, right? Like HIPAA compliant infrastructure, um, one click deployment, stuff like that. And we just realized that like, Hey, this is not the right market to be targeting. And things like this, where it's like, sometimes that second point of like, find the answer in the clouds, you, you, you might go into the ground instead. And I think that it's one of those things where startups are all about bets. And I think you get a finite number of risky calls that you get to take as a founder. And it's, it's about recognizing those quickly and learning from it. Um, and then most importantly is like that number one point of just keeping your foot on the gas regardless, because that's like the single biggest uh, determining factor. Do you have any spidey senses now when one of these risky bets comes up and you're faced with that difficult decision? The actual answer is like, maybe. I think like genuinely like do feel more confident that like as you see those things coming, I would say it's not like you're going to know the right answer, but pattern recognition and just like, you'll kind of like reckon, it's like when you're driving, right? Somebody's merging in your lane. You can kind of tell if they're going to hit you or not. I think yeah. because you've driven so much. I think it's like a similar analogy here of like, you can't be certain, but you have more just intuition around it. Um, in that sense, yeah. You just said that you started in the wrong space and you were platform as a service versus what you're doing now. What is the difference between the two? It's kind of that overall journey, right? Like first it was like that, that AI scribe, like doing all this stuff. Um, then it was like HIPAA compliance platform as a service, right? Can we give you like HIPAA infrastructure? So like, can we click on that AWS encryption box for you and instead just show you a UI? Um, that along with like some of the HIPAA, like just legal stuff. Um, we eventually realized that like everyone has their own setup. Everyone has their own custom things, just like how you were saying in this interview. And like, um, we realized that the better, more direct solution to this problem is just like, is there an AI native approach to compliance itself, right? Can we just like automate that entire thing regardless of the AWS, GCP or Azure setup? And that's kind of like how we stumble into what we do now, right? It's like given any company, any startup, how do we get you compliant as quickly and securely as possible? Trying to reverse those curves and doing so in a manner that helps us change the world one step at a time. Well, I know it is quite tedious, so I appreciate that you're doing that. And I'm going to make sure that every startup that I know hits you up and gets their compliance real quick. Because for startups, it is very important to have the SOC 2 if they want to sell into the enterprise. Uh, so it just shows that what you're doing is hugely valuable. Absolutely. No, thanks so much. If anyone's listening, they need SOC 2. We'll throw a grand off uh, if you mention the podcast. Uh, yeah. Otherwise. A whole thousand dollars? No way. That's awesome. All yeah. Right. 